All right, guys. Uh, so today I want to do a video on the top 10 mistakes I see people making in home theater. And this isn't a, a judgment video or anything like that. It's more of like a roadmap. So if I talk about some stuff and you're like, huh, I wonder if I have that problem, it might be worth looking into. Um, and almost all of these mistakes I've made myself. This whole channel was kind of built on my own mistakes in one way or another. Uh, so, you know, Again, I'm not trying to beat up on anyone or, or pick on them. Uh, and if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe for weekly videos. I try and do uh, videos once a week. I don't get to do it all the time because of my health, but uh, that's what I've been maintaining. So, uh, And I've discovered today <laughs> that coffee on a shoot day doesn't really work for me. It gets me a little too nervy. So if I sound a little nervy, that's the problem. Uh, we've been staying away from coffee and then just recently started doing it again. So if I seem a little off, I think I just figured out that's my problem. <laughs> so uh, I apologize for that. All right, so let's get into the, the top 10 uh, mistakes I see people making. Um, the first one, 10, is well, actually, number 10, right? Uh, 10 is the wrong, the wrong settings on your AVR. And I say wrong in quotations because there's no wrong way to do this, but the little difference in settings can make a uh, you know, pretty, pretty big impact on your listening. Uh, so things like having the, the subwoofer trim too low um, or not having enough bass, uh, you can check out my video on uh, adjusting gain, things like that, the gain hack. Uh, you know, dynamic volume is one of those settings that I'm not particularly wild about. I don't really like the effect it has. Um, and eco mode is another one of those uh, kind of has some, some negative effects. Um, you know, things like that. Uh, there's a, an option called subwoofer level adjust in the audio menu of Denon and, Ave, and Marantz AVRs that can make a difference. Uh, if you don't have that on, you can't make some of the adjustments that I talk about. So that's one of those things. Uh, number nine, having the crossover too low. Now, this is one of those things that gets a lot of people hung up because they'll say, well, you know, they'll say they have a tower speaker and they'll say, well, my tower speaker is rated to go down to 30 hertz. Why would I cut it off at 90? And the, the problem with that is understanding that where you set your crossover at is going to apply a filter of 12 dB for your speaker and 24 dB for your subwoofer. So it's not a very hard cutoff for the speaker, but it's a really hard cutoff for the subwoofer. So the way I look at it is where you set your crossover at is the limitation you're setting for your subwoofers. And by running the crossover too low, it can have quite a few things. Um, I would say at least have them set to 80 or above. I run mine at 90. For the smaller speakers, I run them at like 120. It, it basically transfers the load from the speaker to the subwoofer, giving more uh, greater dynamics and things like that. And as you get above 80, you can run into an issue with localization, but with dual subwoofers, you have less of a problem. So you can run a higher crossover and not have any negative effects. Um, all right, so that's number nine. Number eight, hard surfaces, especially bare floor. So you can see I've got a, a carpet here uh, and I've got a wood floor. When I you know, pull that carpet up and play the, the system, it does not sound very good. <laughs> it is really echoey. Uh, you get these reflections that, that hit the floor and then come up at you and it's just, it just, I don't know, kind of muddies the sound a bit. Whereas when, you, when I put the carpet back down, it sounds a lot smoother and cleaner. Uh, so generally speaking, you want to limit reflections uh, because it's that echoey effect that you don't want. So if you get a really echoey room and you put an excellent system in there, it can still really sound bad. So, you know, if you're running a bare floor, it's worth considering getting some sort of textile floor covering, carpet, rug, whatever. Uh, just something to kind of reduce some of those reflections. And you can do the same thing by putting up curtains and, you know, all that stuff. Uh, but, you know, limiting reflections and the, the hard surfaces really helps. Uh, and number seven kind of leads into that. Uh, number seven is ceiling bounce speakers. Now, this is one of those things, when I first heard about Dolby Atmos, and I, I assumed that it was all about having those speakers that are up firing. 
Well, it's really more of an audio format that is lossless, but does object-based type stuff. And it's really a much more advanced, uh, you know, uh, platform. And so it's not just having those bouncy speakers. It is having, you know, it, they can make sound come from in between speakers a lot better than they used to in the past. At least I've noticed that. When I'm watching a movie that's in full Atmos, uh, it actually sounds like a, you know, a rat's running across the ceiling when they're trying to do that in the movie. So it's a little more convincing. And the trick is you don't have to have the uh, Atmos upfiring speakers to do that. Uh, I'm running the SVS Prime Elevations, uh, and I really like those. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I'm the world's first SVS affiliate, uh, and so what the, honestly, the reason I got into Dolby Atmos was because they released that speaker. Uh, it's a discrete channel, so I'm not bouncing anything, it's just coming from above. That's not a Dolby Atmos speaker, it's just a speaker that's designed for height effects. I also use it for my surround sound because I've got some weird uh, configuration and the angles just happen to work out perfectly. So uh, that's another thing. But you can Google it, you can you know check what I'm saying, but having the discrete sound coming from the source you want it to is generally preferred as opposed to a, a ceiling bounce speaker. You know, as I was saying, you're trying to reduce reflections and then you've got a speaker trying to cause reflections. And so your ceiling may not be the best at reflecting the sound. So uh, I, I would always go with a with an actual speaker instead of trying to bounce it. Um, it's just it's one of those things when I first saw it, I was really turned off by by the whole Atmos thing until I learned more about it. And I was like, oh wow, this actually does more than that. Um, but so that's number seven. Uh, I'm not not a big fan of the ceiling bounce speakers. Um, Number six is also related to Atmos and DTSX, uh, and also True HD and DTS Master. And this doesn't have anything to do with those platforms necessarily. It's more to do with your Blu-ray player. Uh, I've gone over this before, but your Blu-ray player settings uh, may be limiting the quality of the audio you get. And here's the maddening thing: is you can go and spend, you know, two, three, four thousand dollars on an amplifier another several thousand on speakers, put it all together and think you're getting Dolby Atmos and you're not. Uh, and it's because of the settings on your Blu-ray player. Now, some may come uh, default where it's perfectly normal and fine and everything works, uh, but on a lot of Blu-ray players, particularly the Sonys uh, that I've had, uh, I've had to turn a couple of the settings off like uh, BD Audio Mix and, and a few things like that. Uh, it, it cuts it off and I don't know why they do that, but it really makes a difference. Once you get full Atmos, uh, it's, it's quite a difference. And so it's worth getting into your amplifier's uh, manual to make sure that you're actually getting the full setting because if you see it say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of the name, but if you see a setting on there and it says Atmos in it, but it's not Atmos by itself, you may not be getting the full, uh, the full signal. So that's one of those things that really made a difference. I thought I was listening to Dolby Atmos and I wasn't, and I was kind of disappointed. But when I finally got it working, I was like, oh, <laughs> I get it now. I see why this is such a good format. And also another thing is not going through the TV and then your amplifier. You wanna go from your Blu-ray player to your amplifier, then to your TV. Uh, that's another mistake I see. And some of the newer TVs are going to be getting rid of that problem, so you can run it through the TV first. But that was one of those things where for quite a while now, it's been a major issue. Um, so uh, that's number six. Number five, uh, not running room correction. Uh, a lot of people don't run the room correction. Their Odyssey, uh, you know, Wipow, all that stuff, they don't run it. Um, also another issue is they run it and then they don't do the fine tuning afterwards. I, I like to say that your room correction gets you about 70 to 80% of the way there, and the rest is making minor adjustments, which is why I did the video on how I set up my AVR and stuff like that. Uh, it, it really makes a difference when you go in and you fine tune it. Uh, Oh, one more thing about that though. When you're running room correction, you don't want to take your samples too far apart. 
Uh, I know with Odyssey it says not to do it greater than a, two feet away from the, from the first setting. So if you have a chair here and then you measure it way over there, like 10 feet away in another chair, it's, your sound's not going to be great. It's going to be a little bit wonky. So that's one of those things to consider is, is I mean, obviously follow the direction on your amplifier uh, or your pre-pro or whatever, but you know, that's a mistake I've made. I, I would measure in my seat here and then way over there on the sectional and everything just came out wrong. Whereas now I just kind of keep a tight grouping of a four foot circle and it comes out a lot better. And it translates throughout the room pretty well too. Uh, so I know a lot of people say, well, we have got people sitting over there. I want to make sure it sounds good. I get that, but you still want to group it in the middle. So if you've got a chair here and a chair here and they're greater than two feet apart, which they're probably going to be, and you want the sweet spot to be right in the middle of that, you can start your center measurement like in between the chairs. So, you know, that's just a, a tip that you can do. But measuring the, the, you know, doing your room correction too far apart can cause an issue. Now we're moving on to number four, and number four is not adjusting the subwoofer distance by ear. So I talk about going in and adjusting the distance settings of your subwoofer. Everything else I leave the same because it's all, the timing is fine. But when it comes to subwoofers, I find that adding about four feet really changes uh, the response of the subs. It gets rid of some cancellations. It really sounds a lot better. I can take uh, somebody who's kind of new to this and I can have them listen to this very setup in the way Odyssey sets it up. And then I can add four feet to it and they'll be like, wow, it sounds like different subs. Uh, it may not be that dramatic, but it really does make quite, quite a bit of difference. And as I discovered in a video not too long ago, <laughs> there is too much of a good thing. I've, I tried adjusting it like I think it was uh, eight or nine feet over. And while the graph looked great, uh, it hurt my ears a little bit. So, uh, you know, that's one of those things that uh, if you adjust it just right, it does make a difference and it does fill in some of that stuff. Um, so that's number four. Number three, running a single subwoofer. This is a big one. And, uh, you know, a lot of people may assume that running dual subs is just for audio files or just for people that have, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to spend on their home theaters. Uh, it really is something that even with a more pedestrian subwoofer, uh, running duals will help. I would have a very hard time recommending someone get a getting dual $300 subwoofers when they can get dual $500 subwoofers that are going to make a world of difference. Uh, so I know that's an extra, you know, three or $400, but the difference can, can be a, uh, I don't know, it, it can be a big difference. Let's just put it that way. Um, so running duals, uh, I think it's very important. Uh, I think running match duels is a lot easier way to go. I've had the least amount of problems by running match duels. I've tried running subs that are closer. The closer they are, the easier they are to integrate. But I've really found that match duels are about the best way to go. Uh, it's the easiest, I'll, I'll put it that way. Uh, but really, and it's not just you know, getting more bass or being louder, it's about being able to hear all of the bass because you've got a standing wave effect. And when you have one sub, that standing wave effect means that wherever you go in the room, you're gonna be missing out on some frequency response and it's gonna shift within the room. So you might be good at one frequency here, but then you move to the other side of the room and that frequency is gone, but you've got other frequencies that you're missing over here. So it's kind of a, a losing game. Dual subs, knocks down that standing wave and makes it to where it sounds good almost anywhere in the room. Uh, it's not perfect. I mean, you can go into the corner and you'll get some wonky response, but generally speaking, dual subs really improve. And a lot of the stuff you can't even measure uh, as far as like the feeling you get from duels compared to just running a single. Uh, like I said, some of it's just immeasurable. Uh, it's, it's, it feels more like a movie theater, uh, but with the subs I talk about, it's a lot deeper than most movie theaters you're used to. Um, but that brings me to number two. And the biggest reason I started this channel was shallow subwoofers. The majority of subwoofers out there are shallow. They are, um, you know, they don't have a deep response. And it really does 
make have an impact. Uh, there are very few subwoofers out there I recommend. You can see I've got the, the list up here. I don't know if you can even read it. It's kind of whitewashed out. But uh, I've got a list of subwoofers. I'll put it in the description below. It's on all of my videos. Uh, but I've got a list of subs that I would actually spend my own money on. And that's because these subs go down to 20 hertz or lower uh, with true authority, not just registering on a graph, but having power and some, some real uh, gravitas uh, under 30 hertz. And that's really rare in a ported subwoofer. Uh, it's really rare in a subwoofer in general. Uh, but I think it's a very important thing, especially for home theater. It makes a huge difference. And I also feel that way for music. I listen to more music. I'm about 70% music, 30% movies. So most of my listening is with music. And I love big ported box subs that have a lot of low end. Uh, it doesn't make non, you know, if you've got music that doesn't dip under 100 hertz, it's not going to be boomy or loud or anything. It's like how big of a window are you going to have? The bigger the window of bass that you have, in other words, the lower the sub will go, the bigger picture you can get from your music. So you hear stuff that, I mean, even in older music that you never would have heard before if you didn't have a deeper sub. It really makes a big difference. So shallow subwoofers is number two. That's something everyone does. Um, or everyone has started off with anyway. I, you know, again, I started this channel because of my frustration with shallow subwoofers. Um, it's, it's, it really makes a big difference. So uh, you guys can check out the list for that. Uh, number one, I think might be sort of a surprise for some people because it may seem a little advanced, but I don't really think it is. I mean, I guess it is, but not measuring your room response, okay? Um, I've done a video on how to use Room EQ Wizard, how to get started and stuff like that. Uh, but essentially, you know, it's, it's an $80 microphone. Uh, you plug into your computer, the software's free, and you essentially just measure the, you put the mic where your, your head is, and you measure the response you're getting in the room. Now, this may seem like, oh, that's getting way too involved, too techy, but you can really find some things that you're having problems with that you didn't realize. And by measuring that, you can say, okay, well, I've got a problem here and I've got a problem there, and you can make adjustments, and then you can hear a lot more. That, that's been my experience. Just by seeing what's going on in the room, I've been able to identify little problems and get it taken care of. Uh, it's one of those things that, you know, if you're spending two, three thousand dollars on a home theater, which honestly, I, there's a lot of people that spend a lot more than that. Spending the extra 80 bucks to, to get a picture of what's going on, it makes good sense to me. So, you know, not everyone's gonna say, oh yeah, everybody needs to go out and do that. But I think if you're interested enough to, to watch this video, to check out my channel, I think you're probably interested enough to get a, a feel for what's going on in your home theater and getting an idea of what your base is doing. Because that's really the biggest thing is checking out the base and seeing where you've got cancellations. Uh, you can see, you know, if you've got a subwoofer that's not from the list uh, and you can compare it to a subwoofer that is on the list, uh, you more than likely see a pretty big difference. Uh, you know, you can see some real base performance with deeper subs than you see from most stuff out there. Um, so those are the top 10 mistakes that I've seen. Uh, you know, I get a lot of questions from people asking me, you know, what about this, what about that? Uh, and these are the things that I've identified that people ask me about quite regularly. Uh, so I'm curious to know what you guys think. Um, you know, again, my channel is designed to help the new guy out. So there's really no dumb questions. Um, we've all started somewhere and I had you know, the new people in mind when I started this channel. Uh, so anyway, guys, hopefully that helps. Uh, let me know if you have any questions, if you have any suggestions for other videos, uh, other topics you want me to cover. I appreciate you watching and please subscribe.